the top of the hour and um, I believe our attendees are joining and uh, logging in. So I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds before we kick things off. But I want to welcome everyone who's joining us today. So as folk are coming in, um, good evening and welcome to Performance Auditing, a powerful force for accountable government. Um, we're gonna have an exciting conversation today. I'm Dr. Halim Malik Francis and I'm the founding director of the Public Administration Program here at the Tulane School of Professional Advancement. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar with this or are joining us for the first time, our program is focused on preparing forward-thinking and responsive professionals uh, for the diverse careers that span today's ever-changing civic sector. Um, we're one of the most recent public administration programs developed in the United States in the last few decades. And as such, our classes, the classes that make up our MPA degree and graduate certificates speak directly to the most pressing needs that we see in today's society. Now, today, during tonight's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to learn not only about how important performance audits are to the effective functioning of government, but you'll also get to hear from leaders who are doing this work and gain some really great insight into what drew them to their profession and the impact that they make. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping things. Uh, one, today's, today's session is going to be recorded or it's being recorded. So if you want to go back and view it later, share it with friends, share it with colleagues, you can certainly do that. And also, as you hear from our moderator and our panelists, please feel free to use the chat function for any questions that you'd like to have answered during the Q&A and we'll field those questions and make sure that our panelists and our moderator get to answer those questions. So um, thank you first to our panel, to our moderator, Mark Funkhauser, uh, who I am very proud to have as a colleague. Um, he's guiding today's discussion as the moderator. Um, Professor Funkhauser is a, a faculty member in the Tulane SOPA Public Administration Program, and he uh, is known for bringing excitement to our budgeting and financial management course. He's a great faculty member if you, have, if you ever have the opportunity to take his class. Uh, Professor Funkhauser is also president of Funkhauser and Associates and is a mu municipal finance expert and a former mayor of Kansas City um, who served as a government official, elected leader, and, and publisher of Governing Magazine. Uh, he's a trusted and credible advisor to government officials who is uniquely qualified to help them put their communities on the path to fiscal sustainability. So we're really excited to have you, Marg, as our moderator for the evening. And thank you and welcome to uh, this wonderful event. Thanks so much. Thank you, Halima. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to teach at Tulane. Um, it's uh, a really positive experience. Uh, and I wanted to introduce folks at the Tulane community to performance auditing. I've been uh, uh, passionate about performance auditing for a long time. Uh, I spent a long career as an auditor. Uh, and I think it's something that is uh, under the radar for a lot of folks in the public administration community and that they'd be a lot more um, they'd find it as interesting as I do if they just knew about it. And so uh, with uh, Halima's uh, blessing, I put together this webinar and I wanted to bring uh, three uh, folks that I know who are uh, leaders in performance auditing to have them talk a little bit about how they got involved in the field, uh, what it is that their uh, organization does uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, what sort of the most impactful or inspiring uh, audit that they've worked on. And, and the whole point of auditing uh, is to improve community conditions. Uh, you know, and so those are Amanda Noble, uh, who is the city auditor for Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Jenny Wong, who is the city auditor for Berkeley, 
And uh, Erica Smith, who's the Deputy Inspector General for Audit for the IG and the City of New Orleans. Um, and so I'm going to ask each one of them, and I'll start with uh, you, Erica. Uh, tell, tell us how you became an auditor. What happened that you decided to you know, find yourself at the IG's office doing audits? Take yourself up, off mute. I just noticed that. Thank you. That's a great question. Can can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's a great question. So um, very early on, and I say very early, I mean in high school, uh, I had an interest in the forensic accounting world. I wanted to become an FBI agent, and I think I probably watched the movie Feds, which is a really bad 1980s movie, <laughs> um, dozens and dozens of times in high school. And I made my way to the University of Florida and most of my classes were actually in tax. So I, I, I was very familiar with tax and I took one auditing course. As I was going through the interview process with KPMG, they somehow convinced me to become an auditor. I, I really um, thought I was gonna do tax accounting. I still had this forensic um, kind of aptitude and I wanted to kind of move into their consulting side at some point, but I thought the way to do that was through tax. Well, when I explained what I really wanted to do, they said, well, actually the best way to do that is to go through the auditing side. And I thought it made sense. And so I started my career as a financial statement auditor, very basic auditing financial statements, offering opinions on compliance with GAAP. And after about five years of working for KPMG and working until about two o'clock in the morning for months on end to meet deadlines and issue financial statements, my husband came to me and, and he was from New Orleans. I, I was not, I'd only lived here a couple of years at that point. And he said, the city of New Orleans is opening up an inspector general shop. You should apply. And I thought, you know, this is a really great opportunity for me to kind of blend my auditing skills that I had now developed at KPMG over about five years and really jump into that forensic auditing, forensic accounting, um, and performance auditing. It's, it's all kind of intertwined here at this office. And I applied, I, I got the job as a, a, a staff level auditor. And over the past 12 years now, I've worked my way up and, and now I'm responsible for managing an audit department with about $7 billion in assets. So um, I found it to be very interesting, very rewarding. And one thing with the inspector general's office, just for those of you who may not know what that is, our entire mission is to prevent and detect fraud, waste and abuse within the city of New Orleans. So our responsibility is to really make sure that these government officials are using our taxpayer money the way that they should be doing that. And we often sometimes see corruption. Sometimes we just see mismanagement of funds or misuse of funds. Um, but whatever it is that we see, performance auditing and forensic accounting and forensic auditing is the way that we detect that and really help make our city better. So. Thank you, Erica. And Amanda, how did you become an auditor? Um, thanks, Mark. So my experience couldn't be more different from Erica's. I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school and most of college. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, I sort of drifted into social work um, for my undergraduate degree because I wanted to save the world. Um, and then I worked with clients a little bit and it turns out I wasn't really saving the world. And I was interested in grad school and thought, well, I would be more interested in maybe designing or evaluating programs to help people. So I went to um, the public administration program at University of Missouri, Kansas City. And midway through the program, when my advisor um, suggested I uh, apply for an internship with the city auditor. And I thought that was weird because I never had an accounting class. I still haven't had an accounting class. Um, but I went to the city auditor's office in November, 1991. So you know, 30 years ago and met Mark. And I've been a, a local government auditor ever since. So as an intern, then an auditor one, auditor two, audit manager, deputy city auditor here in Atlanta and city auditor. Uh, 30 years, God. I know, I know it's scary. Isn't it? 
Uh, and Jenny, how did you get into performance auditing? Well, like Amanda, um, this wasn't something that um, <laughs> didn't really know what I wanted to do, or I didn't know that I wanted to go into auditing, but it is really the best job that, um, that I think um, is out there for those that like numbers and analysis and um, and really, you know, it's a job that's super rewarding. Um, I had no idea that this profession existed, but I did know I wanted to do public service. Um, my, my childhood and my background, um, I grew up accessing different public services. I was on the free and reduced lunch program. Um, my family um, lived in poverty for a while. Um, I didn't have access to good health care. Um, and um, I knew that I wanted to give back in some way. So I knew I wanted public service. Um, in college, I stumbled upon a work study job working in um, mental health um, department or services within the health department in San Francisco. And that was super fun and exciting to, um, you know, to, to be part of the operations there. Um, I, I wanted to do more. I wanted to be in the policy world. So I went to grad school um, ended up working at the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, which is um, the federal government's, um, you know, audit shop. It's they're the congressional um, arm of um, conducting auditing. Um, and after 20 or after 18 years there, um, there was an opportunity to run for office um, in the city that I live in, in Berkeley, California. Um, I somehow got talked into running I have to say there were um, a couple of other local government auditors that um, called me and said, you have to do this. Um, I'm not one to like the spotlight, but I somehow you know, convinced myself to run for office and, um, and somehow won. And um, it, like I said, it's just the best job ever. I get to be a nerd um, and be proud of it. So that's, that's my plug for auditing. Yeah. I, um... I, uh, the, the nerd thing. So I did, uh, I, I attended one of the, there's the Association of Local Government Auditors. Um, and uh, I was one of the founding members that started very small, but it's a fairly good sized, robust organization now. And uh, I, at one of the meetings, um, annual conference back when we were doing stuff like that in, in person, uh, the president got up to welcome everybody. There were about 400 folks in the room. And she said, it's a critical mass of nerdiness. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, that struck me as interesting and fun. Um, now I'm going to ask each of you to describe your office uh, and your organization and how it's structured and what you do, and also how you were appointed. Uh, Jenny alluded to that she was uh, elected. Some auditors are elected, some are appointed, and there are various uh, structures like that throughout the United States. So, um, so I'll start again with you, Erica. Uh, describe your office and uh, you know how it's organized and structured, and how you are appointed to your position. Sure, of course, no, no problem. That's a great question. Um, so like I mentioned, we are, our mandate really is to prevent and detect fraud, waste, and abuse and promote efficiency and effectiveness in city operations you know, for the city of New Orleans. Um, we are established in the Home Rule Charter of the city of New Orleans. And that's actually very important because uh, we work in a very political environment, but we are very apolitical. And so what you don't want to have is a... Um, an office like ours that is subject to political whim that can be eliminated. Um, so they decided to uh, send it to the voters and the voters of New Orleans said, we're gonna establish an IG's office. It has to be independent from the legislative branch um, and the executive branch. So the mayor of the city, city council, we don't report to any of them. We are completely independent from them. We also have designated funding in the home rule charter. So the mayor couldn't, or city council couldn't in theory say, I just don't wanna fund the office. We have guaranteed funding that is a set percentage of the general fund of the city of New Orleans. So this upcoming year, our budget's about $3.8 million. And again, the mayor can't take that away. We essentially have three um, 
I'll call them kind of departments within the Office of Inspector General. The first is audit, which is what I manage and run. The second is inspections and evaluations, which focuses a lot on um, efficiency and effectiveness as well. And then we have our investigations division. So they handle all of the administrative and criminal aspects of, of our work. We all work together. Oftentimes we will get into an audit and we will find potential corruption or potential uh, misuse of funds. And then we have to work with the investigations division to determine if it really belongs in the audit world or if we need to turn it over to uh, the investigations group who will then ultimately make the referral to the district attorney for potential prosecution. So it's kind of how we're structured. We have right now 14 people in our office. So we're a pretty small office, but we are gonna go on a hiring spree in 2022. We've got um, some excess funds that we're gonna invest in human capital. But um, really that's, again, that's I think uh, probably a good quick way of maybe summarizing really what we do. But again, all three of our divisions really have to work together to, to you know, achieve our mission of preventing and detecting fraud, waste, and abuse. So how is the IG appointed or? Oh, thank you, great question. I didn't answer that part. So uh, the IG is appointed through the Ethics Review Board. So there are seven members of the Ethics Review Board. Each member is um, nominated. There's essentially each university in the city of New Orleans, there's seven of them. They nominate three individuals that then the mayor and city council select one of those individuals. They serve a seven year term. Um, they cannot be removed um, without cause, right? So, um, and then that board will select the inspector general. And then the inspector general is the one who has hired me. And, and does the inspector general have a term of office? They do, uh, four years, and then they can be up for reappointment. We're actually going through that process right now. They had interviews yesterday um, for the new inspector general that will likely start um, in, in January of next year. And they can, they can be appointed for unlimited terms. There's no term limit. So they could serve four years, eight years, 12 years, um, so long as the board wishes for them to be employed in that position. All right, thank you. Uh, Amanda. Um, so like New Orleans, our city charter established an independent audit function. I think there was a charter review commission in the 90s that recommended this, uh, but the city didn't actually hire an auditor until 2001. Um, the we are a strong mayor form of government. So to be independent of the mayor and council members, the, the charter establishes an audit committee. It's five members of citizens that are appointed by, um, one is appointed by the mayor, one is appointed by the council president, and three are appointed by the, um, the full council. And uh, audit committee members, they have qualifications, they need to be residents and have at least 10 years of experience as a CPA or CIA or professional management experience in audit finance or law. Um, they serve uh, four year terms and can serve two consecutive terms. Uh, let's see, yeah, up to two consecutive terms and then they can be reappointed again later after being out for one term. So the audit committee is responsible for overseeing the audit function and appointing the auditor. So the, um, but the auditor is then confirmed by the city council. So, and then um, the auditor has a term of five years and can only be removed for cause by a majority vote of the city council. So these, these provisions ensure independence because we're outside of the reporting line from the, the agencies we're auditing and the, we're insulated somewhat from the politics. We can't be, uh, you know, I can't be fired if I put out an unflattering audit report. How many staff and how, how are they organized and that sort of thing? Uh, let's see, we currently have 16 and a half. Um, we're in the middle of reorganizing, but we have like three different performance audit teams and I have a part-time person who's working on continuous audit, uh, which is, you know, we've been working with the finance department and its consultants and, and a little bit um, 
HR to develop some tests to run just all the time to look for anomalies. Uh, we, the city has a separate Office of Inspector General, and that was a fairly recent legislative change. Um, so we do not do any investigations. We, uh, we look at red, for red flags for fraud um, and internal control weaknesses, but if we saw something that pointed to like individual bad behavior, we would refer it to the Inspector General. Um, did I answer your questions about, about how we're set up? Sorry. Uh, and uh, so you're appointed to a five-year term. Uh, are you in your first term, second term? Where are you in that? I am in my first term, uh, which ends next May. So I'm, I'm hoping to re be reappointed for a second term. All right. All right. Thank you. And Jenny. Hi. Um, so our our office is also a charter office um, and, you know, establish the the uh, auditor, um, you know, established to really ensure that um, things are fiscally um, sound in the city. Um, you know, reviewing payments um, that leave the city. Um, I'm elected, um, so I had to go through the, for some people, a fun process of um, <laughs> of um, trying to, uh, you know, I actually think it's a really great process because you're out there helping people understand why it's important to have this oversight function. Um, so I was elected three years ago. It's a four-year term, um, and I am planning on running again um, for another four-year term. Um, it is a, um, uh, you know, it's an independent office because it's elected. Um, I don't report to the city manager. I don't report to council, um, but I obviously work, um, you know, with them on a lot of different issues. Um, our mission is to pr promote um, accountability and transparency in Berkeley government. Um, when I first came in, we established uh, core values, um, and they're the four I's, uh, integrity, independence, impact, and inclusion. Um, and many of us do wear glasses, so four I's um, work very well. Um, uh, we do, I actually have two different units, one that conducts performance audits. Um, these are the audit reports that, um, you know, go out to the public. Um, but I also have a unit called payroll audit and they um, do some of the oversight on payroll operations. Um, again, that's part of the charter um, mandate to ensure proper payments. And, you know, these are the largest expenditures that leave the city. Um, let's see. Um, what else? My office, um, you know, we can um, basically audit whatever um, we determine is of highest risk um, to the city of Berkeley. Um, I obviously get input um, from city council members, um, st um, staff in the departments, um, and the community in making that final determination. Um, and there are charter states that we um, we'll, you know, we will have the resources necessary to, to conduct an audit um, and that we have um, full accessibility to whatever we need, which is a very important element in ensuring that we can actually conduct um, these audits. How many staff do you have? Oh, I have um, 14 people total. Um, that includes me. So I guess 13 that work on my team besides me. And we have five in um, performance audit. All right. So uh, a, a couple of uh, themes that uh, I want to make sure that the folks listening to this get. Uh, one is that all three offices are established in the charter. Um, and in some cases, uh, that might have been a long time ago. Uh, and, and in other cases, it might be recently. Uh, and it almost, and well, Charter revisions almost everywhere require a vote of the public. And almost uh, in other work that I've done, when citizens are given the opportunity to vote for an independent audit office or performance audit function, they vote yes uh, almost every time. They, uh, while the, the work is uh, nerdy, 
and technical, and it sounds like green eye shade stuff. It's not hard to explain it to citizens, uh, and they get it, and they like it, and they generally vote uh, yes for it. Um, the the uh, next question I want to ask each of the panelists is, I want you to tell me about uh, and uh, the impact of your work on the community that you serve, and especially to focus on one audit that you are uh, particularly proud of that you think represents sort of your best work on behalf of the citizens of your jurisdiction. Uh, Erica, we'll start with you again. Sure, great, thank you. So I've, I've kind of talked a little bit about how we do a lot of forensic accounting and, and we look at expenditures and make sure that they're really being spent for the purpose for which they're intended. Um, you know, tax dollars usually have restrictions on them. We probably, most of us pay property taxes and those things oftentimes can only be used for a certain purpose. So we do compliance work in the sense that we make sure those funds are, those funds are being spent in accordance with the law. We also do work to make sure that those funds aren't being misspent to a, a criminal nature, you know, maybe for personal expenditures and things like that. Um, but also there are audits that we do that don't involve money at all. And one of the audits that I am most proud of did not identify $1 that was misspent. What it did identify was a systematic problem within the city of New Orleans that was really a quality of life issue. And it's a hard topic to talk about. Um, and so I hope um, that everyone is comfortable with this. If not, maybe please let me know. But a number of years ago, we did an audit on the New Orleans Police Department's reporting of sex crimes. And so what we found essentially was we were getting some tips and information that the New Orleans Police Department was downgrading, um, you know, uh, 911 calls of sexual assaults. So just to give a little bit of background so that you kind of know a little bit about what this is, when you call 911 and let's say you were to call and, and someone you know said that I've, I've been raped, and again, this is it's a horrible topic, but I'll get to a good part of this at the end. There is a certain signal that the 911 operator assigns to that call. And in this case, it's what's called a 42. So what we, we're getting information on is basically that you would have victims calling into the 911 center. And oftentimes these victims leave the scene. They go to the hospital or, you know, they go somewhere else. I mean, they've been traumatized. And so what was happening is that the New Orleans Police Department was arriving on scene and they couldn't find the victim or for whatever reason, they were downgrading that call. So they would basically change it from a 42 down to um, what we call a miscellaneous offense, which is a 21. So when you downgrade a call, it's no longer being investigated. So you have a victim that has been sexually assaulted and now their case is not being investigated because it's been classified as something else. So we did a lot of audit work around this to figure out how many calls were coming in, how many calls of sexual assault were being downgraded. And we found that it mostly related to five detectives in the city of New Orleans, but they were downgrading horrendous crimes. I mean, there were children that were, um, had tested positive for sexually transmitted diseases and um, just, I mean, really horrible. I mean, I guess it's, it's hard. Again, this is a really hard topic to, to kind of cover, but um, we would have to, as auditors, read through these case files and the uh, crimes are essentially established in the Louisiana revised statute. So there are certain elements of a crime that make it a crime and, that, and those definitions are in the statute. So as an auditor, we would look at the statutes, we would have to read the case files and basically make sure that the elements of the crime as laid out in the statute were in the case. Um, and we found that these um, elements were met for sexual assault. So these crimes should have been uh, classified as sexual assaults, but yet they were being downgraded to 21s or miscellaneous offenses. So um, this audit came out. It actually made national news on CNN. And if you probably Googled some of this, you could probably find some of this. And so what happened then is real change in the city of New Orleans. And for those of you who may you know, be familiar, New Orleans Police Department has been under a consent decree for a number of years now. 
And so what happened is we started working with the New Orleans Police Department and rape advocacy groups and stakeholders of, of this kind of issue to develop a policy and develop processes that now require the New Orleans Police Department to approve at a commander level any downgrades of sexual assaults. And so that way you get this kind of um, second eyes, you know, on this, on these really horrific crimes to make sure that they are properly downgraded or reclassified to um, a signal number that fits the elements of the crime. So uh, we went back and we did a follow-up audit a number of years later, and we found a remarkable turnaround. There was one exception that we found. And when we did the initial audit, I think it was about 46 to 50 percent of these sexual assaults were downgraded um, incorrectly. And uh, but the New Orleans Police Department, in working with them and working with these rape advocacy groups, they were able to develop these this very strong set of internal controls. And when we went back again, we found one exception. So I'm most proud of that because there was no money involved, but it was priceless in the sense of how do you give victims a voice, you know, um, when their crimes aren't being investigated. And so having these victims be able to just have their crimes investigated and kind of be brought to a resolution is really priceless. So it's worth really, I think any, you know, any dollar amount or any amount of money that we found that has been misspent in the city of New Orleans. So I hope that kind of makes sense. But, um, but that's why I'm most proud of that. One of the hardest audits we've ever done, I think just emotionally, and uh, I was a, a new mother at the time. And so, you know, for any of you who go through that process, it's very challenging. And just reading these really kind of horrific things, it was emotionally challenging, but also very um, technically challenging because you're really dealing with the law and you're looking at a lot of really tough case files and pulling out pertinent facts just to make sure that they're properly classified. So I'm most proud of that audit. Thank you, Sal. And the impact is uh, some people got justice who otherwise would not have. Uh, absolutely. And, and it's a really a quality of life issue, you know? So um, these victims really get their, their cases investigated and quality of life is just as important as, at least in my opinion, as you know, finding where money is misspent within the city of New Orleans. So. I agree, exactly. Uh, Amanda, a little bit about the impact of your op uh, office and uh, an audit that you're most proud of. Um, so sometimes it's, it's hard to see impact right away with uh, local government. It, it tends to move slowly. Um, but one of the audits that I'm proud of uh, was our um, police department body-worn cameras audit that we released uh, December 2018. We, uh, we undertook the audit actually at the suggestion of then police chief Erica Shields, which is a little unusual. And I think that helped the audit be successful and have um, more impact. Um, but she recognized that body-worn cameras improve transparency and accountability of officers on the street and dealing in, with their interactions with citizens. And she was concerned about potentially low compliance with officers using the cameras. So we, um, we compared uh, the number of uh, uploaded footage to 911 calls and found that the officers assigned to where the cameras captured video, video for only a third of the dispatch calls for the period we looked at, which was a little less than a year. Uh, we looked at a random sample of videos and saw that among the even the third that where they had videos, um, 30 to 40 percent were activated later than policy called for or prematurely deactivated. So we um, we made a lot of recommendations uh, to clarify the policy about when it should be on a little bit on the technology and recommended different performance metrics that the police department could use to monitor compliance with the program. And I think um, the department has implemented those recommendations, but what I'm proud of is that it, the information was timely. The department um, 
improved compliance. And by the time we had the civic unrest in June 2020, um, the most of the uh, serious incidents, there was body cam footage to support disciplinary actions and in some case prosecution. That's that's incredible. That's so. And that changes behavior, you know, disciplinary action, prosecution. Uh, no. Yes. And we, um, I know you told me to pick one on it, but that's kind of like saying, which is my favorite kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yes. So okay. we, we did another audit of, of the police, um, sort of as a result of the, um, the, the civic unrest, we looked at police hiring and our report mm -hmm. came out April, um, 2021. And um, it, it got much less attention than the body-worn camera where there's massive non-compliance because it turns out that the police department was actually doing a pretty good job hiring. There were controls in place to weed out unsuitable candidates. And there was a lot of you know, high emotion about all these police officers being bad apples, et cetera. Um, but what we found was that it requires just a huge pool of applicants to hire enough officers on the street. We, um, what, the period we looked at, there were over 12,000 applications and the city ended up hiring 171. So 92% of the applicants who uh, began completing sort of the second step in the hiring process withdrew. So we made recommendations that even if there were small improvements in the number of applicants who completed this portion, they could the city could hire 50% more officers, which has been a big issue in a big issue in the um, recent mayoral election. We need more officers. So we, we made some recommendations to, to keep candidates in the pool longer and hopefully be successful. But we also, as part of the audit, we confirmed that the applicant pool and the eventual hired officers were demographically similar to residents, at least racially similar. The women are still um, a little underrepresented. Very good. That's, uh, so that's interesting too. And it's interesting that it didn't get nearly as much uh, attention. Um, and the hiring uh, more, more officers who are also qualified officers, there's a lot of research to show that uh, having more officers uh, improves behavior. Having fewer officers uh, degrades behavior, and doing lots of overtime uh, degrades behavior. When there's high levels of overtime, there are high levels of citizen complaints, abuse of force, all that sort of thing. So, if uh, if the city can figure out a way to hire the number of qualified folks that it needs, that improves a lot of a lot of the community interaction. All right, Jenny, the impact of your work and uh, an audit or more <laughs> that you're particularly proud of. Um, well, I, you know, one of the things that um, that is really exciting about local government is that um, you're, you know, you're living in the area that you're serving. So you get to, you know, interact with your neighbors and, um, you know, I'm a parent, um, so interacting with other parents. And so um, one of the things that I did when I was running for office was as I knocked on doors and told people I was running for office, I also had all my volunteers um, do a quick survey um, and ask what issue do you care about? What department do you want audited? And from that, um, you know, collection of information, um, one of the top interests was why do our streets look this bad? Um, you know, there was a recent bond measure just, you know, seven, eight years ago, and why do our streets still look this bad? So that was one of the top issues. Um, so we launched an audit looking at the street conditions in Berkeley, and we dug um, deeper and we found that um, there wasn't enough funding that um, the, the, the prior ballot measure wasn't enough to um, improve the actual quality of the street paving. Berkeley streets, along with Oakland's, our neighboring city, uh, were among the lowest in the entire Bay Area. 
um, there just wasn't enough funding dedicated to um, improving the quality of the streets. And at the rate that we're going, um, we are going to deteriorate into um, uh, with deferred maintenance into, I think in like eight to 10 years, um, over a billion dollars. So this was a, a huge issue that is going to just compound itself. We found that streets, um, if you don't fix the quality of the streets now and you wait longer, then the costs actually is even higher. Um, so we, we showed um, graphically what that, what that looks like. Um, we also um, looked at um, how they allocated the funding uh, among the available funding that they have. And we found that, we pointed out that um, there was an equity concern with the allocation of funding across the geographic um, districts in Berkeley. Um, and again, that, you know, that's a very difficult thing to point out. Um, but we pointed out that the Hills quality streets were, were higher quality than the flats of Berkeley. Um, and um, I guess I'm just really happy with this because um, the, the, the city council is currently revising its policy to now address quality, uh, equity. Um, the, you know, before this was in place, the way that equity was being discussed was that every council district got some money um, but that is not the definition of um, equity, as we know. It's it's around it's about serving those that need it the most, um, and so that is currently being revised and discussed um, to to be updated. And we pointed out some best practices from surrounding areas. Even Berkeley's own bike plan has an equity component. So just you know, one of the things we can do is, as an auditor is point to what other cities do, which is why. I love collaborating with other fellow auditors. Um, you know, Erica, I, I've been, I've talked to Amanda on different calls. Um, I hope that we can, can like, I, I've just gotten so many great information from my um, colleagues in other cities. They do great work and it really helps us do our work. We don't have to reinvent. Um, but, you know, the second part of the um, uh, street paving is, there was lack of funding. So um, council is currently now considering a ballot initiative to increase revenues to address that lack of funding to ensure we have adequate funding. Um, and I guess the, the, the thing that I, I mean, this is the one thing that people keep talking about is, um, especially council members, they tell me that the number one issue they get calls about um, are streets. Why isn't my street being paved this year? And what they tell me, they're so appreciative and they say, we just send them a link to your audit. It is fantastic. I don't have to explain. I just send them a link to your audit and it answers their questions. So the fact that we're able to help with that aspect um, is just really great. That's uh, that, that final point that Jenny made, um, that's, you know, when our work, when, the, well, I say our as if I were still auditing, I'm not anymore. Uh, when the auditors do the work well, one of the things that they do is translate technical material into terms that ordinary citizens can read the audit report and say, oh yeah, this is, this is what's wrong. This is what needs to happen. Uh, I, I get this uh, and sort of uh, pierce what I call the veil of expertise. Uh, and make it so that ordinary citizens can understand what's going on. Um, uh, one of my objectives, and I, th I think we achieved it, was to let people know that th this career option is out there, that there is something that is um, interesting and fun uh, and rewarding, and you can give back to the community and the things that you care about uh, can be positively impacted through this work. Um, like uh, Amanda, I started out as a, a social worker. Uh, I had no idea uh, auditing existed. I stumbled into it by accident. Uh, and But when I did, uh, and I th thought, okay, as a social worker with a caseload of, uh, say, 100 foster kids, I can do a good job and impact their lives. But if I, as an auditor working, say, for the state of Tennessee, I can impact the positively the way the whole state manages the foster care program. I can impact the lives of 10,000 kids. 
Uh, and I thought, oh, wow, this is some great stuff. Uh, and then, you know, you add to it, uh, and I think the, the, the panelists mentioned this, I know Erica did, but I think all of you have this authority, the authority to interview anybody you like, uh, subpoena records, go where you want. Uh, when I saw the, you know, the power that uh, the audit function had, um, I, I could look anywhere. I could ask anybody and they had to answer the questions. Uh, this is uh, under oath. This is a really good thing. Uh, we're uh, closing in on the end of the time. Uh, again, if people have questions, I want them to put, put them in the chat function. Uh, I'm gonna do one last round of uh, questions with the, with the panelists. Uh, and that is um, in this last uh, part of the webinar, uh, given what you've heard uh, and what the uh, sort of objective is here, what is the one uh, main thought that you want to leave with uh, the audience? And, and again, Erica, what is the one main point you'd like these people to hear? I think with performance auditing, you're always doing something new. I, I, you know, when I was in public accounting doing the financial statement audits, you kind of do the same thing over and over again, but for different companies. But when you're in performance auditing, I've never done the same audit twice. I might do a follow-up to a previous audit, but that's the extent of it. Everything that I do is new. And that's what makes me stay in this job for so long because you don't really get bored because I'm always doing something new. And um, so for those of you who are thinking about maybe getting into this profession, it's not boring. You know, you really get to try something new every week, every month, um, and there's no playbook for how to do it. We have to create new audit programs for every audit based on the audit objectives and based on the risk within that audit. So um, it is, it's fun. It's definitely fun. That was one of the things I loved is it's always something new. Uh, yep. You go straight from the street resurfacing program to the uh, body worn cameras program. You know, yep. it's always something new. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Amanda, what's the one thing you want to leave with the audience? Um, well, I mean, as you pointed out, Mark, just that the profession exists, there's lots of opportunity out there. Um, we need auditors, we need critical thinkers. You don't have to be a numbers person necessarily to be an auditor. Um, so I, I also really love that we're always doing something new. And by the time you start to get really sick of the audit, it's over and you can move on and have more fun. Um, and I'm still learning, which I enjoy. I mean, if even after 30 years of auditing, we get into a new audit and I'm learning a new topic. We're just finishing up an audit of streetlights. That's been really interesting. Um, uh, let's see. I had another thought of what I wanted to leave with people and I'm losing it. So I might have to come back to that. All right, that'll be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, you know, the, the always something new and we need folks. Um, that, that's absolutely true and always learning something. Um, one of the things that I, before the session is over that I wanna leave with the audience is that this is very much an international phenomenon. The performance auditing, uh, I recently put out a call uh, to some folks for exemplary audits, performance audits from uh, overseas. And um, I got an audit uh, put out by the Auditor General of Western Australia, the state of Western Australia, about uh, uh, how well they were or were not delivering ear health to Aboriginal children. I uh, got an audit from uh, Tanzania on uh, how well they were delivering uh, rural water access uh, and an audit from Ghana on how they were coping with uh, uh, maternal health issues and maternal uh, deaths. Um, it just, uh, it's, and those are all really good audits done uh, very professionally. Uh, it's, it's all over the world. So if you, if you sign up, you've joined a, an international cohort of folks who are doing good work. Uh, and it always leaves me uh, inspired. I always go away from that stuff saying, well, I think we're going to be okay. 
<laughs> as, as bad as things look, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, Jenny, what's the one thing you want to leave this crowd with? Oh, gosh, I have too many things, so I have to pick one. Um, I, I think... I, I think for me, just um, the fact that this is a job where you really can truly have impact. Now, sometimes that impact doesn't happen, as Amanda says, until later. Um, but, you know, in that moment, you are shining the light on a really important issue in your community. Um, I, I just, I love the fact that in this job, we get to translate what people care about um, and need into something actionable. You know, we're, we're, we're giving them a guidebook and saying, here is what the needs are in this community among, you know, or this issue, and here's how you go and, and make it better. Um, and so, and, and you can do that while you're nerding out, um, which for me, that's a really good fit. Um, and I have to say, when I first started my profession um, at GAO, um, it was just so much fun um, knowing that I can have that impact and that, um, you know, you get to work on really exciting topics, you know, body worn cameras. Um, I mean, dealing with, um, you know, really interesting issues, infrastructure. I worked on um, terrorist financing um, schemes when I was at the GAO. I mean, just really exciting stuff. So, um, and it, it just, for me, it's just that that's probably, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> All right. Uh, before I wrap it up, uh, Amanda, did you have the, the thought? Oh yeah. It was basically what Jenny said earlier. I think most of our really successful performance auditors just really have a public service bent. So uh, you, we get to do things that help people. So, you know, I wanted to do social work to help people and I'm, I'm helping more people now. And local government is especially fun because you're looking at the services that are absolutely closest to people, the public safety, the, you know, sanitation, water utilities. So. Right. Yeah, it's social work by the means. Yeah. Yes. All right, uh, Halima, that's it. I think we're, we're it's a wrap. Yeah, and I just wanted to, um, before we close out, we do have a, a message here in the chat and, oh gracious, I just lost it. Um, one of the attendees shared that they're proud to say that you guys are protecting the welfare and safety of the taxpayers and that you're preparing professionals to become future chief audit executives and make a better world. So. Um, Thank you to the attendee. I think that was Lung who, who shared that. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I, I couldn't put it any better myself, honestly. So um, I really appreciate your work. Uh, Amanda, Jenny, Erica, and Mark. Um, Mark, thank you for bringing this conversation to us. Um, you're absolutely right that is often one of those fields, one of those professions that kind of flies under the radar. Um, and it's really interesting that you all bring things that fly under the radar to the public. So um, thank you so much for this. Uh, hopefully uh, those who attended, those who have logged on and joined us for today um, have enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I certainly got a lot out of this um, myself coming from, um, a large nonprofit and philanthropic background, I can truly appreciate how uh, performance auditing stretches across sector and has that, that far reaching impact. So um, certainly for those who are interested in this field, please um, reach out to us and talk to us and, and uh, let us know if you have an interest in learning more and uh, we'll try to uh, perhaps maybe shape in the future, Mark, a class that <laughs> focuses on this um, and invite our wonderful panelists to be a part of that as well. Yeah. Um, here you have our contact information. We would love to stay connected. Um, and here's listed ways that you can uh, stay up to date with our events and our programming. Certainly my email is available. You can reach out to me directly. Um, also follow us on all of our social media uh, channels and, um, and really stay updated on what we're doing. So with that, I wanna thank you again for joining us and have a good night. All right, thank you. And thank you very much to the panelists and the attendees. Thanks.
Thank, Thank you. you. It's Bye -bye. been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.